Oh, I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the Biotech Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. Thanks for coming tonight. We do this every Wednesday night 50 times a year. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Keith Poulsen. He's with the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. He sent me an email way back in March, I think, saying he had this kind of interesting story he would like to share. Was there a slot open? And I'm delighted to have this chance to have him give this story on if you grew up on a farm, are you immune to farm bugs? Uh, Keith was born here in Madison and raised in Wanakee. Went to Wanakee High School, came to UW-Madison for his undergraduate degrees, uh, got a DVM and then a PhD here at the School of Veterinary Medicine. Then he went to Oregon State in Corvallis for a couple of years, and then in 2014 came back to UW-Madison to be with the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. For those of you who don't know, that would be me until about seven minutes ago. Um, I didn't realize that the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory was actually part of the university. I thought it was a separate entity on campus, but it actually, since 20 2001. Since 2001, it has been part of the university, and that's only 16 years ago. I'm starting to catch up. <laughs> uh, they have a beautiful building over there by the School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and I hope Keith will tell us more about that story as to why the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab is here at UW-Madison. I'm looking forward to this tonight. Um, it's a pretty interesting premise about who gets sick from what and does it really matter where you grew up and what you're exposed to and the whole idea of the salmonella, uh, multiple drug resistant salmonella outbreak here in Wisconsin last year and earlier this year fits in pretty well with all this. So would you please join me in welcoming Keith Polson back to Wednesday night at the lab. So uh, for anyone that's that new that just came into the room, take your phone out uh, and either go onto the UW net and register as a, a guest or you can use your uh, cellular connection. Go to menti.com and for those of, those of you who are watching online, you go to menti.com and add the, the code in at the top. It's 835526. And it allows you to participate in some of the slides in the lecture. And at the end, when we're all done, you can type in your email address and all of what we're going to do can get emailed right to you. And you'll get screenshots of what's going on. And the reason why the, the title of this talk has been something that I've been uh, dealing with for quite some time uh, well, I grew up on a farm. Why, why do I have to worry about this? I should be immune to it. And I actually kind of sometimes subscribe to this theory myself as I'm a large animal veterinarian. I practice large animal medicine at the School of Veterinary Medicine. I was at a farm in Wanakee today and a genetics company in DeForest. Um, and I often don't wash my hands. I grab that donut, eat it, and rock and roll, right? And I don't have to worry about it, or so I think, right? And uh, this really came to a pinnacle in 2010, 2012 when we were in legislative issues with uh, legalized sale of unpasteurized dairy products in Wisconsin. And as part of those uh, legislative hearings, that was th the most common argument that we heard. Me as a public health official, I was talking about the, the risks of pa unpasteurized dairy products, especially by consumption in urban populations. And that was what I got sitting from the legislator, sitting up there saying, well, I grew up on a farm, I drank raw milk, I seem to be okay. And that's, I was too, I, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I, I carried milk buckets from the cow to the bulk tank before they had an overhead pipeline. And you know, I don't have, I'm, I'm not even 40 yet. Um, so that really wasn't that long ago. Um, and I seem to turn out okay. I'm gainfully employed. I have three small children. My wife's a veterinarian in Lodi. I live in Lodi now. Uh, so that's really what I, this is a common theme and people wonder. and. When I'm out on farms, I'm talking to farmers or producers and employees on farms. It's, these are things that really come home. And really what we're gonna talk about are some two zoonotic pathogens, Salmonella and Listeria. Zoonotic means that uh, it's a bacterial or viral infection or fungal infection that is either harbored or carried in animals and can, be, uh, can infect humans. Can go the other way too, right? We're animals, we're mammals. Uh, we can infect cows as well. That happens. First off, let's start. When you get to menti.com, hit the little thumbs up. That way I know how many people are in a room and I know when I can move on to the next slide. And there's a few different things we wanna think about. 
first, how many of you in the room had grandparents, at least one grandparent, that grew up on a farm? Click yes and hit submit. And there were 17 of us in the room, so. And most of my, my grandparents were uh, greatest generation. I, both my grandfathers uh, are in World War II. One was on a, a cook on a submarine. The other one was a foot soldier in Paris. Couple more. Pretty close. 50 50. Almost. All right, that's everybody. Nine and 10, one more. Anybody else? All right, remember this number, nine and 10. It's about 50 50. What about your parents? We got a couple of people that aren't connected, so I think we're still ahead in the in the farm. Who grew up on a farm? I think the data will will still work out okay. We're at nineteen. Okay. See, how that was a pretty drastic change in one generation. Oh, but there's more. I heard in the. How many of you grew up on a farm? Well, I'm not, I should be answering myself. That's how I go slow, is I make sure I answer as well. Otherwise, I go too fast. OK, we're at 19. Dropping precipitously. So if you go on the UW Wi-Fi or UW Net and you scroll down, you can register as a guest. And if anyone at the end, we can contact Tom and we get your email address and I can fire these results off to you when you're done too. Okay? Two and 19. How many of you live on a farm now? We started with 10. Yeah. I have a six year old boy and a four year old boy and a one year old uh, daughter. It does definitely feel like Animal House. <laughs> All right. So, what does this mean? That I think that's really important is that we talk about, I grew up on a farm, I'll be okay. But when we're talking about food production, I'm a food animal veterinarian, I deal with dairy cows some horses, but that farm immunity or exposure immunity, just like being on an airplane when someone sneezes on you, you get exposure immunity from that, right? We're not on the farm anymore. And when we're making food for the rest of the population, we make more milk now than we did every year. Our milk production goes up and up and up to feed more and more people. But the people that are eating and consuming and drinking our products aren't born and they're not in rural areas. Our population is shifting from rural to urban areas. So it's changing our risk. And when we think about this as public health officials, veterinarians, doctors, people that might be in maybe the grande and the pro uh, processors, right? Their demographics are changing. So their risks are changing. Okay? So now I want to switch back to how I came to this talk. I work at the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. We are about 100 people strong. We're right behind the School of Veterinary Medicine. You can see our building when you drive by in Campus Drive. 90% of our caseload is bovine, so cows. The other 10% is poultry. Now we're at 100. There's a few dogs, horses, cats, and mink. They, but they make up less than 1%. So we're mainly an agriculturally based lab. Half of our testing is done for genetic export. So we're helping the companies around us. Everyone drives by ABS and their wacky signs, right? That's where I grew up. Um, we help them export bovine genetics all over the world. That's m half of what we do. The other half is that we're testing for management of clinical disease. 
I don't, where I'm trying to change our motto is that we're not really in the testing business, we're in the animal health and profitability business. That's really what we're trying to do for Wisconsin agriculture. And that's where some of these people are doing in the pictures on our title slide. This is me, if you have any questions, my email will come up a few times here and there and you can search me on the wist.edu. About this time last year, uh, I was sitting in my office and another professional services veterinarian down the hall, his name is Dr. Don Socket. Um, he has been uh, at the diagnostic lab for over 20 years and he walked in and he said, you know, I've got this really strange uh, Salmonella isolate. It's called Salmonella Heidelberg. Okay, that really probably doesn't mean much to anyone and unless you've been in Germany uh, where the Heidel, there is a Heidelberg um, or you've seen this in the paper, there are over 2,500 different types of salmonella. So Heidelberg is one of many, right? And he said, you know, I have this client that uh, bought some calves in, in Wisconsin. They, they brought them down to the Purina Research Facility in St. Louis, Missouri, and they were looking at different milk replacers and how fast calves grow with their new milk replacer products. Well, unfortunately, they were very sick and we found the salmonella in there and look at the antimicrobial drug susceptibility. We test all of our salmonella for what type of antimicrobials can veterinarians use to treat this infection. Right? This one happened to be sensitive to only one antimicrobial, which unfortunately is illegal for use in food animals. So that doesn't really help us very much. And he said, golly, this is quite strong and it's really multi-drug resistant. Okay, so what do we do about it? So we walked up to bacteriology and we talked to Dr. Nicole Olick. She's our uh, section head of bacteriology. She said, uh, holy cow, that's quite a resistance pattern. Maybe we should talk to public health. So we did. Uh, we, we talked to the Wisconsin Department of Public Health and Dr. Rachel Close and Dr. Jim Kazmerzak, who's our public health veterinarian, said, that's really interesting. Let's look and see if we have any human infections. They haven't really been thinking about it, hadn't cropped up on their radar. Well, it turns out they had 11 infections so far. And they started looking at it, and by golly, they had the same resistance pattern. Kind of interesting. So that led to this, uh, the, this, these two slides. They don't reproduce very well on your screen. But the CDC got involved because it's a human and animal health issue, and it's a very multi-drug resistant strain, along with lots of other different health departments around the country. It turns out 11 states saw uh, infections, right? And they were concentrated, where's my cursor, in uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, and South Dakota. And then we have a few in California, Idaho, Texas, and Oklahoma. Just like salmonella does, we see a few in the summer. It goes away in the winter because it's nice and cold. And once it gets warm, it crops up again. And the interesting part of what we found here is that usually when you have a salmonella in a serotype, they are a little bit genetically different, right? They're not all the same. Well, these that we found in the multi-state outbreak with the help of CDC, they were almost genetically identical. So that really makes us think, ooh, we still might be close to the point source of what's going on here. The other very interesting thing is when we sequence this pathogen and with the help of the state lab of hygiene, uh, we found that the and the multi-drug resistance part of the bacterium, the, those genes, were are not chromosomally mediated, they're on a plasmid. Most of Salmonella's antimicrobial drug resistance genes are on the chromosome. Why is that important? It's important because the chromosome doesn't change very quickly. Plasmids are pieces of DNA that move in and out of bacteria and it can confer changes and mutations very quickly. So that becomes all of a sudden quite interesting because this, these the genes that encode for multi-drug resistance could move to other salmonella quite quickly or to other bacteria like E. coli, okay? So that, that's why this is so interesting. Here's what we found, 35 cases. This data is just a little bit old. I think we're at 37 cases now. Uh, and this is all from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Rachel Close, she's uh, in, my, in my class. Uh, we graduated veterinary school in 2004 and she does epidemiology uh, associated with veterinary medicine and public health. <coughs> Wisconsin seems to be overrepresented. Um, it has the most cases uh, per uh, state. The other issue, uh, when we look at it, the me median age range is pretty young. We tend to see more of these in younger people versus older people. 
Most of them are female. Um, we hadn't had any deaths, but about one in three are hospitalized. Now, why does this happen? When we went back and they did the tracebacks with the uh, assistance of Department of Ag and Consumer Trade, uh, with uh, Dr. McGraw and Dr. Conkle and Dr. Patton, uh, we went back and we identified several sale barn facilities in, in Wisconsin, and they went back and they did some testing on those on, with the full cooperation of, the, um, of those facilities. And then we went back to a couple of different farms. And it turns out the reason why we have a uh, preponderance of younger people with this infection is because it's the younger kids on the farms that are feeding the calves. And mainly women feed calves on the farm. There, there's more women than men that feed calves on the family farm. That's just the demographics of who works on the farm. So it fits pretty well. And then everything seemed to cluster through the sale barns. Now, why do calves go through sale barns? Well, there's one other uh, kind of interesting component of this is that most of the calves we find this are, are in dairy bull calves. What do we know about dairy bull calves? They don't give milk, right? So when a cow gives birth to a calf, you have a 50-50 shot of a female versus a male, right? Normal uh, Mendelian genetics, right? Um, unfortunately, we, we raise the, the females for replacement heifers that give milk, and the, the males either go to a very, very small percentage of them go to the genetics industry for uh, artificial insemination. The most of them grow out to, for beef. We call them dairy bull, dairy bull calves or dairy beef. Most of it's ground beef because we don't uh, select Holsteins to give juicy filet mignons, right? They're designed to make milk. So most of these beef calves, dairy beef or Holstein, are going through these sale barns to different farms that are being raised for meat. And that's where we're seeing this. And the sale barns are the, are the point of commingling and where the infection is spreading. And because this is so genetically similar, we think that we can go back and look and find um, few source farms to then clean and sanitize or decontaminate or decrease the risk. Whenever I talk to a group, the first thing I think of uh, people that think about a dairy bull calves is this, a rodeo bull. When really what we're talking about with dairy bull calves are calves that are 100 pounds, they look just like dairy heifers. Uh, you know, and people don't understand what a dairy bull calf is. So especially when my, I talk to the, the physician crowd, that's the first thing they think of is the bull bunking bronco. But we're talking about little calves, and that's why calves on milk and why kids are feeding them is why kids are overrepresented in the infection. Okay? So most of them are exposed to dairy bull calves. That's where most of our infections are coming from. And 86% of them are from Wisconsin patients that grew up on a farm. So that kind of shoots our theory of farm-based immunity. And that's really, other than changing demographics from urban or rural to urban populations, this is the second message that I kind of want to convey today is that that doesn't hold true for all microbes on the farm. Multidrug-resistant salmonellas is a very good example of that. This one is new. The one that we constantly battle, and if you talk to the Department of Public Health, is they'll tell you about multidrug-resistant salmonella newports. Right? Same problem. They're overrepresented with, with people that work on farms. It doesn't really make sense. You're always exposed to it. Why don't you develop immunity to it? It's a very good question. All right? This is actually what we're dealing with with dairy bull calves. Right? <coughs> Cute little buggers, aren't they? Yeah? They, they drink out of the big bottles. Remember that when you worked on the farm? So we found so far 53 highly antibiotic resistant bovine isolates. We also find poultry isolates on a regular basis at our laboratory in Barrett, but they're not genetically identical. They're not even close. They have the same serotype, but they diverge greatly. They are not multidrug resistant. So I think we're pretty confident saying that the turkeys are not giving the calves some of them All right. The trace back seems kind of easy. And when you think of, when's the last time we had a, a food outbreak? When you think of um, bag salad or cantaloupes from Colorado, or when you go to Costco, Costco can tell you that bag of salad, they can tell you where they bought it, where it was stored, what field it came from, and when it was picked. We can't do that with animals. We, the trace back on animals, and most of this is politically motivated, um, we don't know where they came from. When they go to a sale barn, it's almost like their identity evaporates. 
this little ear tag here, that can be placed by anyone, right? A little bit different in Canada where there's permanent identification from birth. So I think we're gonna get there. We'll get there someday. It's better than what it was. When you go to World Dairy Expo, they require this electronic identification from birth. Um, and I think industry like Dairy Expo and looking at Canada, we'll get there, but we're not there yet. And that's the reason why we don't know where all these uh, affected bull calves are coming from. There's a couple of dairies, probably several, and as the outbreak grows, uh, it'll be more and more, and we see more and more positive facilities. But that's the reason why we can't go back and find farm A and farm B and say, okay, this is the source, let's clean and sanitize here, mitigate the risks, and hopefully we won't have downstream effects, right? It's not the farm's fault, but we'd really like to go back to identify it. We just can't do that right now. We thought we could because we had such a genetically identical strain, but it's just, we're just not there yet, all right? So how does this uh, re uh, compare to the other salmonella cases in Wisconsin? So this is just one strain, and remember we said it was about 17 cases in Wisconsin. How does that compare to the rest of the cases in Wisconsin? Well, in 2015, we had about 936 reported cases. So how many did we actually have that weren't reported? Quite a bit more than that. You know, we have a, we have to kind of um, equalize that back onto what is actually reported. Not everyone goes to the doctor when they're sick, right? You might have some GI disease and you might take some Pepto and you'll be better in the morning. You know, everyone's a little bit different. Not every time you go to the doctor with a stomach ache do you have to do a fecal culture, right? That doesn't happen every time. So we don't record all cases. We actually record more of our bovine cases because it's a lot easier to go in a calf stall and get a fecal sample. Right. So we have about a thousand cases a year. Right. This is just Wisconsin. How does that uh, compare with other uh, microbes that we have that are associated with animals or animal environments? So everyone remember uh, Cryptosporidia in Milwaukee in 1987? I remember that. Topps baseball cards had a wooden outline and B.J. Serhoff was a uh, rookie for the Brewers, rookie catcher. Uh, I was in third grade that year. Um, Campylobacter, you probably read about Campylobacter and raw milk associated outbreaks. The raw milk outbreak in Duran, Wisconsin in 2012 was a Campylobacter. Uh, crypto, we talked about crypto and then we have the shigatoxin producing OH157 E. coli, which are down here. We read about those quite a bit. That was, there's another, um, disease with hemolytic uremic syndrome. It usually affects small children uh, with some pretty devastating effects. But when we look at salmonella, salmonella is pretty high, it's on top. And I'm gonna show you why, especially in the environment, why we think part of that might be the case. I can tell you based on the MDR strain, uh, multi-drug resistance in the human world is resistant to four different types or classes of antimicrobials. That's the majority of what we deal with in veterinary medicine because we have a much smaller uh, arsenal of antimicrobials to use because we are producing food for people. And is anyone in here allergic to penicillin? I'm not, but my children are. Um, so that's the reason why we don't want penicillin in our milk supply, right? So I can tell you what we found, we just did a retrospective study uh, with uh, Janice Venezuela, she's a MPH, DVM MPH, I just finished her MPH, uh, and Dr. Sethi in uh, Population Health and Sciences. We looked at all of our salmonella isolates for the last 10 years, and when we look at multi-drug resistance changes, um, we found a decrease in resistance to several antimicrobials that we've had new rules in place. So I think kind of the key take-home message of this slide is that and what we're doing with the veterinary population through um, the Food and Drug Administration and the USDA is working. Things like the veterinary feed directive or changes in labeling or changes in legality and use in labeling works, right? Because you read a lot about antimicrobial use in food animals. What we're doing is changing it. And this is some data that we published in the Journal of Dairy Science that really points towards that. We also looked at a few things, and unless you deal with cattle on a daily basis, you may not recognize these drugs, but they're two, one of the two most common drugs used for bovine pneumonia, which is the second most common disease of dairy cattle and the first most common disease of beef cattle. What we did find, what we were concerned about with these drugs, 
uh, was that they are used a lot and we thought that by using these drugs uh, you might convey resistance of other bacteria like salmonella because salmonella rarely causes pneumonia. We didn't find that which I thought was very uh, reassuring. <laughs> so that's what we, what we did recently. Um, our isolates are kind of interesting. Our, we, have, we, we also named our top 10 serotypes. Three of them match uh, Wisconsin human top 10 isolates. This is what the, after considering uh, when the Heidelberg outbreak came out, remember we talked about talking to public health. And this is a, a great example of collaboration between the veterinary uh, field and the human medicine. It's kind of under the auspice of the one health, one world concept, where if we all work together, we're all animals, right? We all live in the environment, it's all interconnected. This is a great example, and I think that's very unique on the University of Wisconsin campus because we're a land grant institution and also the flagship. It's great to have the medical school a block away from the veterinary school and pharmacy and nursing, right? That doesn't happen everywhere. And I think that's partly why this was so successful because everyone talks on a regular basis, okay? So this came out from public health that talked about um, making sure that if you, are, you have salmonella that you get it serotyped and look at the antimicrobial resistance before you prescribe antimicrobials, right? It seems like a no brainer, but just remember when you go into the doctor and you feel kind of cruddy, you kind of want something to help you out. You don't want to wait two or three days for that um, antimicrobial resistance, right? So it does take time, right? You got to think about it. You got to submit it, it cost money, right? Okay, so it's not as easy as we think. And the other uh, thing that we, I think it's really important is that they define multidrug resistance as five or more types of antimicrobials. And so th this is a big deal because there's a lot of antimicrobial classes that are affected. So to wrap up this uh, part of what, what we're gonna talk about here, to, how do we fight salmonella? We, don't, we read about it a lot in the news, right? How do we actually do something about, about it? I think um, it's, a, not a pro, it's not a program animal disease. So in salmonella and, and veterinary species is not reportable. It is in humans, uh, but not veterinary species. So it's harder to trace back and, and look at the statistics on these infections because we're not required to report them. We send all of our salmonella and Newport isolates to the state lab of hygiene. We watch that pretty closely, but that's voluntary. Okay. Um, there's a problem with public education. That's why Wednesday night at the lab is such a great forum. Um, and we spend a lot of time with public education about what is salmonella, what does it mean? Salmonella is not the only bacteria or virus out there that we worry about. So public education is really key. And, and the connection between veterinarians and physicians and um, public educators, including the media, that's really important. And that's what we're trying to work on. And it's key that the veterinarians are talking to the, the public health officials the same as our physicians so that we identify outbreaks earlier, right? Public health really wasn't thinking about this until we brought it up. Then they went back and went, oh Lord, look at this. And it happens both ways. All right, so it's a collaborative event. Now, remember when I told you, why does salmonella, why do we worry about the environment in salmonella? This is really cool research, right? If you don't think this is cool, you should check your pulse, okay? <laughs> All right, so we look over here. These are salmonella that uh, Chuck Casper, he's at the Food Research Institute in the Microbial Sciences Building. He works on E. coli as well, OH157. What he did is he fluorescently tagged these salmonella organisms so you could see them. And then what he did is he stressed them. So you can stress salmonella by drying them out. You can add high salt concentrations. There's all sorts of stuff. What do you think about dust? Dust is usually pretty dry, right? right? So in barns and other environments, when they get contaminated, when salmonella dries out or gets stressed, it forms these really long filaments. And that's what this is cursor went. There it is. That's one salmonella organism. And you notice the, down here it says that this is about five microns, so these bacteria are one to two microns long. These can get up into the hundreds of microns long. It's kind of cool. Why does it do that? It's just the way that it survives in the environment. Right? So salmonella, that's why salmonella survives so well in dusty environments. It has this adaptation that it changes its morphology to survive. Now, you remember the International Peanut Corporation? 
five, six, seven years ago. Remember when we had the peanut butter contamination issues? That's because they had salmonella in a part of the roof. And they, uh, when the roof broke and it got wet, all the salmonella got wet and vegetative growth all over the place. Right? But that's what happened. Now what happens when you put water, put pour water, you de-stress the salmonella. That was at a similar filament. You, notice how these all look like individual little salmonella again. So that one little two micron salmonella organism went to be about 100. You got it wet and it multiplied. Now you have 100 little salmonella organisms out there. So you get a few log phase growth. Can you remember anything else that you're not supposed to pour water on from the 80s? Remember gremlins, right? It's the same thing. It gets really nasty when it gets wet. They go back into vegetative growth. So this is a really interesting adap adaptation of salmonella and how it can survive and persist in the environment. And if anyone's been in a barn, they're dusty, right? You have a question? Does the filament grow from a single cell, or is there something Nope. It, it, so it's, the filament's one cell that elongates. Yeah. And then when it gets wet, it breaks up. And it's just almost like asexual reproduction in a worm, where you get, then you have multiples. So it continues to make DNA? Yep. Yep. All right. There's another sample of return to vegetative growth. These are all individual viable salmonella organisms. I thought that was really cool. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. And this goes back to how we started the talk and back in 2010, 2012, when we talked about uh, unpasteurized dairy products. This is kind of near and dear to me. This is what I did my PhD on was listeriosis and how it affects uh, pregnancy. Um, as a veterinarian, I see listeriosis as circling disease or silage disease. And when we talk about listeria, we, it's, um, it's just another bacteria out there. And what I think I, what I would like to do now is kind of show you how we look at it as a veterinarian and the similarities and the differences between human medicine and veterinary medicine. So I'll show you what we see in cows, right? And why is it a zoonotic issue? Why do we see this is because just like um, you have normal staph aureus on your hands, right? Or cows have normal staph or organisms on their skin. They also tend to shed uh, different types of bacteria without clinical signs. And listeria is one of them. And that's the reason why we have the pasteurized milk ordinances to decrease the, those contaminants in our milk supply, right? So this is a picture from the newspaper. She actually sat behind me in one of the legislative sessions. She's very nice until the session started and then she heckled me. <laughs> so I'll never forget that. It was a, quite an experience. Uh, so anyway. All right. So why is Listeria monocytogenes important in people? It's really not that old in people. Veterinarians have been dealing with silage disease and circling disease for eons, right? decades, many moons. But in List, uh, for humans, we really haven't recognized it as a clinical syndrome until the, the early to mid-1980s. And it really was associated with hot dogs in the eastern part of the country. And why hot dogs? Because it was a processed food. We had a contamination problem in the plant and it went to lots of hot dogs. Okay? Now, why do we care about this? Um, it, it's a fifth most common cause of bacterial meningitis and it's second in elderly people. CDC estimates about 3,500 cases a year, but 500 deaths. Now compare that to uh, salmonellosis, which is closer to in the millions, or uh, virally mediated enteritis, like norovirus, in the tens of millions. But they don't have a death rate like this. That's why listeria is really important, because infected people have a high mortality rate. So that's important to know. Here uh, is the other thing is that when we tend to think about foodborne disease, many people, their, their first reaction is to say, well, uh, usually foodborne disease is places where food's dirty, so you might think of low and middle income countries or people that are maybe campers out in the field where you could get dirty food. That's really not the case with many foodborne diseases today. And remember the questions that we talked about earlier is because the population changes, right? We go from rural cases to urban. So people are not growing their own food. They're buying food that's in processing plants or is collaborated into larger distribution facilities, so you have a higher chance of contaminating a lot of food that then gets distributed. And that's exactly what happened on a Virgin Airlines flight. And uh, I, I use this example, even though it's old, it's from 2009. This is a flight to Australia. 
and they had some contaminated chicken salad. Every pregnant woman on that flight that ate that contaminated chicken salad went into premature labor. Okay, so that that's a, when we contaminate a feed stuff like that, it can be quite devastating. Four women on one flight. And the picture down here, when we think about and why I have chili up there, is, is a colleague of mine at a Listeria meeting in, in Portugal was talking about uh, Chile is their economy is rapidly expanding. They're quickly becoming uh, uh, out of the middle income country and into the industrialized nation. And he said, you know, Listeria really isn't a popula uh, problem in our, our rural populations. It's, a popula it's an issue with uh, the people that are buying food in supermarkets and that are buying uh, expensive, tasty, raw foods. And he said, it's, it's, this is a, a wealthy person's problem because they're buying expensive foods that they're shipping in from all over. They're not eating local foods, okay? So this is, this is an issue of urban population and the human issue, so that, or the human population. So that's the reason why we really look at listeria. I'm gonna talk about the risk factors in listeria a little bit later. Now, what about food animals, right? I did this when I was a kid, not quite like that, but I worked on the dairy, right? And when we, when we had a break, we put, we got some milk out of the bulk tank, we put it in our hot chocolate, right? We ate cheese and butter, and that's what, that was our break. I loved it. it got a dollar an hour. I couldn't get enough of it, right? So uh, one thing we saw, uh, Suzanne Gibbons-Bergner, who's at uh, Public Health now, she uh, was at the Diagnostic Cup at the time, and she found about 20% of bulk tanks in Wisconsin have Listeria DNA in them. So there's, there's contamination in there, whether the cows are shedding, which is likely the case, um, or it's coming in as a post-collection contamination. Q fever, which you may have heard of, is at 90%. Well, that doesn't really make sense, 90%, but we really don't see that much in humans, right? So there's kind of a disconnection there. What about uh, beef cattle operations? Beef cattle operations, it's uh, closer to 20%, and it's mainly in the cow-calf lots because the cows are around longer and they're dealing with reproduction. Uh, we also see it in swine, but it's much less. Um, so really, when, I, when it gets down to it, it's in our food population, and that's why the pasteurized milk ordinance is the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Okay, so food animals. There's three different types of uh, clinical syndromes in food animals. I'm a food animal practitioner. Uh, we talk about how does listeria, how do you infect, is the same as in people with things like enterotoxigenic E. coli and salmonella. Mainly it's from uh, fecal oral contamination or oral cavity contamination. Um, and it invades the oral mucosa of your mouth or your tonsils. Um, or it could uh, uh, also be absorbed in your GI tract. The interesting part where we see these two diseases in people where it can cause, especially in pregnant women, which have a 20 times greater likelihood of infection because while you're pregnant, you're immunosuppressed to maintain your pregnancy. And that's why listeria seems to be a problem in pregnancy. Um, it can cause fetal death and miscarriage. In, in veterinary medicine, we refer to those as abortion. Um, but that in the human realm uh, connotates uh, miscarriage on purpose, and that's not what we, the same thing in veterinary medicine. Um, we also see gram-positive neonatal sepsis, which means bacterial infection in, with it throughout the body. So that's common in, in our species and in, in neonates, uh, human neonates. And here's the interesting one that uh, you may have you heard of, but uh, bet you haven't seen it. And this is circling disease. So, and I'll show you a video of this. Um, so cows eat hay, right? Everyone knows that. Well, have you ever picked up hay or alfalfa hay? It's, it's not uh, like jello. It's pretty scratchy, right, stemmy. Right? So while they're eating it, if you ever looked inside a cow's mouth, they've got some pretty gnarly teeth in there to grind that stuff up. Well, um, that, some of that stemmy forage can cause small um, uh, lacerations or cuts within the mouth, and we think that Listeria, uh, on, with that's normally in soil and that food that they eat, um, invades their tonsillars, uh, the tonsillar crypts, and the oral epithelium, and it migrates up one of the cranial nerves that controls a lot of how the mouth works and inserts in the brainstem. So the listeria migrate up that nerve root up into the brainstem, and it causes a, a small abscess, and it causes animals to walk in circles. I'll show you what that looks like. 
So it's <coughs> circling disease. It's kind of interesting pathophysiology. It's kind of similar to rabies, where rabies is a virus that travels up, up nerves. It's kind of interesting. So the first clinical syndrome that we think about with listeria is abortion or miscarriage in cows. Right? Sometimes we call them abortion storms. Um, because as one animal aborts, and remember it's a common, just like on that Virgin Blue Airlines flight, uh, when you have a common feed source that's contaminated, cows do the same thing. They all eat from the same diet that's all mixed together, right? So you may have more than one pregnant animal that aborts at once, right? As silage is uh, more associated with contamination, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a little minute, in a minute. Uh, the other thing that happens when cows, that this is my favorite uh, Bonnie Moore painting. She's a a, a bovine artist you see at World Dairy Expo. The first thing that happens is just right down here, this picture when a cow either gives birth or uh, aborts, is that everyone goes to look at it and then they all sniff it and lick it, right? So that causes a point source of contamination for all the rest of the pregnant animals in the herd, okay? So that, and that happens with horses with viral, that, that's a herd mentality, so that happens. So it kind of spreads that infection around. So that's why listeria causes um, uh, abortion storms. Um, and then abortion or miscarriage without any clinical signs of the cow being sick is very common. And that's because these cows are exposed to listeria all the time, right? And they're only different because they're pregnant. Right? So it changes their immunity and the listeria pathogen affects the placental unit to cause the spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. So we talked about silage. Um, remember our, our, our graphs of most people live in the city now. Not everyone knows what silage is. Many of you drive around and you see silos, and we know those are silos, but we don't really know what silage is. This is an example of uh, feeds at the veterinary school. So silage is in silo feeds. That's how we store feed. It's a fermented food. Like, does anyone eat, uh, drink yambucha? Right? That's a new fermented drink, right? So that's a fermented food, just like sauerkraut It's fermented. Okay, so we ferment it to store it, and so we can feed it out with a consistent diet throughout the year. This is an example of fermented uh, haylage or baleage. So this is alfalfa that's chopped and then put into a silo and it's fermented. This is an example uh, compared, cursor, compared to just regular baled hay, which is the one in the middle. That's what we typically see with the big bales out in the field. Um, really, for we usually use small bales to store them because we don't have as many can, issues with them. This is corn silage, so this is the entire corn plant chopped up and then siled to feed cows. Most of the corn around here is chopped up for corn silage. This is the, the main component of our dairy cow diet. And we compare the, uh, come on. Compare the corn silage to, this is high moisture cracked shell corn. So this is what we mainly feed cows, and we mix in a couple of different ingredients. Each cow, each dairy is a little bit different diet, but that's what ensiled feeds are. We ensile it to store it, so we can feed it throughout the winter. Those are, we all know what silos look like, right? In the 1970s and 80s, these were the fancy ones. They're called harvestors. They're blue and aluminum versus the old cement upright silos. You don't see very many of those anymore. You ever notice that? They're kind of few and far between. They're on hobby farms, small farms. Most people store things like high moisture shell corn in them. They don't use them very much. Now we see a lot of these. You see these when you're out driving around, these plastic bag silos. Do you know why we use these? These bags cost a couple hundred bucks a piece every year and they're disposable, right? Why do we use them? It's because they're not taxed. It's not considered an improvement on your, on your property, right? And so instead of building a big silo, you can put 50 or 60 bags out there. Right? And each bag can be a little bit different, right? so you get some flexibility in there. They're hard to feed out though, I mean you can imagine trying to get a skid steer in there. This is at, uh, this picture is at Charmony Instructional Facility on Mineral Point Road. I fed cows out of one of these guys and I didn't like it because I had to do it by hand. Um, but they can be harder to feed out, but you don't have to pay taxes on them. This is an example of a bunker silo in Ohio for a farm that feeds 10,000 cows. And the reason why bunker, we have bunker silos, and you'll see these if you're driving out on Highway 12. I live in Lodi, so I see those every day when I'm driving, is that there you, this is a tractor driving on top of the silage right here. 
you'll start to see this in August. You might see why is that tractor driving in the cow food? What it's doing is it's compacting that food down and getting rid of all the air. And then they'll put plastic over it, which is right here. And then they put rubber tires on it to weight it down so the plastic doesn't go because you want an anaerobic environment so everything in siles down and it ferments. Okay? And the reason why we do these is that it's a lot easier to feed cows out of these bunker silos and there's less wastage. This is an example of how they get fed out. See, that's a really nice, clean face. They have special equipment that goes by and will shave off silage, put it in a mixer wagon to feed out cows into a total mixed ration. Okay? I hear weather warnings. Okay, uh, we just, uh, we're, we're, we're coming to it. Now, we talked about listeria in silage, is that why don't you just throw out the spoiled silage? Listeria in silage is actually can be, it, it's not visually present, right? This is an example of butyric acid contamination of silage, and that's pretty easy to see. Looks kind of like Neapolitan ice cream, <laughs> right? It smells like rancid butter, so it's not the same. <laughs> um, and it's from a clostridial overgrowth. And this is, when you think about, remember that picture of the tractor driving on the, sil on the, uh, the corn silage? Something happened in, at this layer that didn't ferment quite right, and you had an overgrowth of clostridial bacteria. So cows sort through that. They will not eat that um, because it, it's, it's really gross. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Gary Etzel. He's at the university at the veterinary school, and this is a, a classmate of mine, Patrick Shaley. He practices in Chicago now. So listeria, can't, you can't see it. So it can be hard to find, and it's really easy to feed that out to a herd. Now, that's abortion storms with cows. Now, we also see a neonatal sepsis. So uh, by a neonate, I mean a young animal less than two weeks of age. Uh, this is very common uh, presentation. This is a, a Holstein bull calf with meningitis, and they, it's quite painful if you've known anyone that's had it, uh, considering all your sensory is in your brain, and this is an infection of your brain. Um, so they tend to stargaze. This guy did okay uh, with antimicrobial therapy. Um, but this is the, one of the second most common cause of bacterial meningitis in, in uh, baby calves. This is an example of a crea. So this is an alpaca crea with meningoencephalitis. So hopefully this plays. Media not found. Oh, that's right. It's on my computer. So they don't talk, right? Um, they make they hum, but it's not like a, a person that can tell you that they hurt. But this is what these animals look like. This animal's hanging its head, it's very depressed. It can walk, but it, it's a little bit clumsy. Um, so this is what a, a, an example of what a, a, a young animal with meningitis, how, it, how they present to us as veterinarians. So this is how they clinically present. We treat them with antimicrobials. We can image them uh, to make sure that they don't have anything else. We run uh, another laboratory test to help us treat, diagnose and treat them. Now, this is the, the common thing that I really wanted to show everyone because when you read listeria and cattle, we think about circling disease. So not all cows with listeriosis infections in their brainstem um, circle. This is a picture, some kind of cows that have infections or inflammation in their brain will head press. And this is what they look like when they, they head press. They'll stand against the wall and they'll press the wall. I don't know why they do it, that's what they do. This cow is actually totally normal, and she pressed the wall because she was bored. <laughs> but that's my, the best example of head pressing of a cow picture that I have. <laughs> this picture is a picture of a goat with listeria. These, this is pretty subtle. So if you don't do this every day, you might not notice that this ear is different than this, this ear. That one's down, one's up. When you look at how the eyes are, this eye is closed versus this one's more open. The, the nose is not symmetric, so it's weak on one side, so it pulls to the other. And you might notice that the tongue is sticking out because it has trouble controlling its tongue. And it's because these are abscesses in the brainstem, and I'll show you a picture of that. So how did, this is, or here's the picture right here. This is not that goat. This is a, a, a cow brain from a cow that uh, was euthanized due to uh, listeriosis. These are microabscesses in the brainstem here. This is a cross section of the same spot, these little red spots, those are microabscesses in the brainstem. So can, you can imagine that most of your cranial nerve function 
and motory control is in your brainstem. If you have little bacterial infections in your brainstem, you're gonna have trouble with how those nerves function, okay? So, and that's the reason why these animals will circle is because it's only, and they may only be in half of the brainstem. So they're affected one side and they tend to walk in that one circle. This isn't gonna work either, probably. Nope. So this is a picture of a colleague of mine at Iowa State, this bull. Uh, you'll see him chewing and then he'll drop food and he'll also drool a lot because he can't control his tongue and his lips. So um, he also has ear droop on this side right here and you see his eyes closed. So he's sitting here trying to eat and he presented for weight loss because he couldn't swallow enough feet because he chew, chew, chew and it would just kind of fall out of his mouth. Kind of like if you go to the dentist and you can't feel half your face and your ice cream goes all down your shirt. It's the same thing, but it's corn silage. Okay, so that's a mild case. Um, severe cases, this is a, a pregnant 14 month old heifer from our teaching herd that presented, she's circling, she's, she's holding up on the wall to kind of hold herself up. Um, and then she did go down uh, where she couldn't stand up anymore. She actually did quite well with antimicrobial therapy and some supportive care uh, with padding and we gave her some IV fluids. And so it can be pretty dramatic, um, but this is one of the reasons why I'm very interested in this bacterial disease because there's something I can do about it to fix it. Now I have this video that's not gonna play either. This is a, you'll actually see me walking in there 10, 15 years ago, so I don't have as much gray hair. But this heifer, that's the same picture of the heifer that we saw in the picture before. She walks totally in circles. You cannot get her to turn the other side. When you look at her face, her eyes have nystagmus, so they move, right? This is circling disease in a cow, right? So it, it is exactly what we call it, is a cow walking around in circles, okay? So you saw it here. Now, why do we talk about listeriosis in people? We talked about it because it's a foodborne disease. It's a, it's a disease of unpasteurized dairy products and ready to eat foods like the chicken salad or um, um, cold cuts, right? Pregnant women shouldn't be eating cold cuts because there's a higher chance of contamination of listeria in cold cut meat. Um, so those are ready to eat foods. Um, the reason why listeria is an issue is because it's really hard to clean in, even off of stainless steel and all the nooks and crannies, right? That's why we see this as an issue in our food. Um, so really, I don't wanna scare people so you never eat bologna again. I eat bologna, not every day. Um, I eat ham sandwiches, I go to Jimmy John's. Um, and it's really more of what are, what's your risk? And that's where I think the third part of, the third message of the talk, going from our demographics change, some bacteria are different than others, and really understanding your risk. So are you at a, a population, or are you a person, or are your children, do they have a different immune system than what you have, right? My one-year-old child, I was on a farm today, um, and I wasn't dealing with the cattle, but I was on clinics last week, and I took a shower before I picked up my baby, right, when I went home. Um, kids under the age of five have a higher, they're higher represented for things like salmonellosis and other uh, uh, foodborne diseases or zoonotic disease. Other people that we really think of, and I, I make fun of city kids, I'm a, kind of a city kid. My kids are definitely city kids, right? Um, that they aren't born on the farm, they aren't on the farm all the time, so they're not exposed to some of these microbes. They're different, right? Some of these kids bathe in Purell, right? Every time you turn around, it's right? So you don't have the same flora that we used to. So that's important. Um, the elderly and immunocompromised, we all know as we get older, it's harder to fight off infections. Your immune system changes as you get older. The last one that I wanna talk about is pregnancy. So pregnancy changes your immune system. So knowing your risks, whether you're pregnant, you're immunocompromised, HIV patients are immunocompromised. If you're on steroids for rheumatoid arthritis, that changes. That's why your doctor tells you that you need to be careful. You need to wash your hands, right? Um, because it changes your immune system. So I don't think, um, I'm not here to tell you to stay away from things. I'm telling you here to be cognizant and know your risk and wash your hands. 
know what's going on. Don't put yourself in a spot that um, increases your risk past to where you're comfortable. I eat sushi, I eat raw products, I travel the world, and I've eaten some really strange things, right? I'm okay. Um, I'm obviously, I get enough calories, right? <laughs> so know your risk. Now, I'm not quite done yet. Get your phones out again if you still have them. Go back to Menti. It's the same one if you go right back to your, your hopefully, it, if all you gotta do is turn your phone on. And I'm hoping that this is a good message that comes through. Can you avoid all animals? Anybody allergic to cats and still have a cat? We do at our house, right? I, I don't know why, I'm a dog person. Know your risks, this is important. Pregnancy, age, immunocompromising uh, drugs or uh, conditions, small children, extremes of age groups. Okay, good, everyone's listening, that's awesome. <laughs> Woo, someone moved ahead, this is great because we're running out of time. So how do, I de how do I decrease this risk? All right. We wash our hands with soap and water. Um, Purell is okay if you don't have soap, but soap and water is better, right? We wash our food, we cook our food, right? Does anyone make Hot Pockets or anything in the microwave? And you read the instructions. I, I'm not that far away from college, so I, you know, the food out of a box is really not that far away um, but it says let rest for two minutes before eating you're like Psh, yeah right right and then you eat it and you burn your mouth it's like hot lava that's really that post heating effect is really important because that risk that that time after heating the food on the inside is still hot and it requires that time to actually kill that anything that might be in there right you can't avoid bacteria hopefully everyone knows that or knowing that you really need to cook the pepperoni on your pizza that's a meat product. Follow the instructions, check for ticks, that's great. Yeah, that's not a zoonotic infection, but it's a good thing that we think about in Wisconsin. Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, cook less animals, cuts, preparation. I think we're good. This is awesome. I always get uh, answers when I do questions like this I never thought of, so thank you. And so, then when you click next on here, you can type in your email address and it will send you everything that we did with the Menti. It doesn't have all the rest of my slides, but it will have, if you're interested in your results of the people that you're here, because I'm assuming many of you see each other every Wednesday. Um, so you, you can get all of this email to yourself. This Menti program is free. Um, I, I use the $4 a month um, because it has a little bit more functions, but you can, it is free if you want to use it for any other group that you have. With that, um, uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I love talking to this group. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, you shoot me an email at any time. Yes, sir. I have a question on, on actually measuring what your risks are. I mean, you say that as you get older, you get less immunity. If one's pregnant, there's less mm -hmm. immunity. But how, how does one, let's say, measure what you think should be your subjective idea of what your risk factor, what your risk really is? You know, that's, uh, I, that's a really common question. So certain, uh, we'll just take food, for example. So there isn't an exact number. I think talking to your physician or your pharmacist when you pick up a prescription about what are the side effects and what should I be looking for, and we're, we have general risks out there. Not everyone will be the same. Um, and so let's say, um, I would, I'll, uh, an example with food with uh, my small children, I wouldn't give them food that I would eat on a farm. I wouldn't give them unpasteurized products because they're not exposed to it and they don't have a fully developed immune, um, immune response. Another thing that public health with small children, a good example, is uh, reptiles. So they're not, they don't recommend that small children have reptiles as uh, pets until they're five years of age. 
because they have a high carriage of salmonellosis. Same thing with backyard chickens. So salmonella and chickens, they're like uh, click and clack, right? Yeah, they're, they're just, they're there. Um, it's something that we, that we deal with. Um, other things are, you can always look up on the Google machine, right? But I would talk to your doctor and, and think about it all as kind of a holistic approach. And that's really, we're talking about the human side, the animal side, and your environment. Because there's a lot of different things that uh, will cause risk of just going and driving a car. Uh, things that affect with foodborne disease or zoonotic risk are going to be very dependent on your lifestyle and your own personal makeup. That's a hard question to answer, but it's the most common that I get. Yes, sir. So, like for uh, salmonella, where there's so many different kinds of strains. Yep. If one's infected with one, do you get long-term immunity just to that one, or just to some, or do you get immunity to the Great question, and that I answer that question for for cattle herds almost every week. Um, the 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 short answer is there. It's serotype specific but there is some cross protection. But when we look at vaccines, humans, we have salmonella vaccines for typhi, which would be typhoid Mary, that's the same strain, right? Endemic in many parts of the world. The typhi, the salmonella typhi of cattle is called salmonella Dublin. And we have a vaccine specific for that strain of salmonella, but it doesn't seem to have good cross reactivity for other serotypes. So it's, it's pretty specific, um, but there, there, we think that there's very minor cross reactivity. Right now, um, it's on the top of everyone's mind because we're finding it, and it's kind of in that epidemic phase. So we're seeing it because it's the hot topic that we that, that's that we the hot serotype right now. That doesn't go. And remember, we show that's only when we have teens cases compared to a thousand different cases in Wisconsin per year. Uh, we see more multidrug resistant salmonella Newports than we see Heidelberg. Heidelberg is so, is, has so much um, excitement around it because of the plasma mediated resistance and because it's so genetically similar, we think we can control it more than the salmonella Newports that are very genetically variable. that we know of. Okay. It's very rare. Okay. I don't know if it's the only one, but it's one of very few. Okay. Yes, sir. Can we, can we go into your original paradigm of uh, immunity on the farm, and how would you expand that to city dwellers and asthma, uh, if, if uh, asthma is greater in the city because they're not on the farm, mm -hmm. how would the city dwellers get that immunity in the city? That's a that's a, a very complicated and multifactorial question for a food animal veterinarian. <laughs> uh, the exposure as much as, you, as possible, I think, is kind of where we see. If you talk to a human neonatologist, they'll talk about breastfeeding. That's a very common thing that you may hear quite a bit of, uh, with that being associated, a lack of breastfeeding is associated with asthma, specifically to your question. Um, it's hard because the city is different. And our diets are different. Our microbiome and our, and our gut is, is very different than it was 30 years ago or 50 years ago. So it's multifactorial, I would say. Um, and being as diverse as you can to what you're exposed to um, within reason, um, I think is our, the key to developing and maintaining that immunity. Not, not playing video games and watching TV all day, maybe spending some time in nature. I have that constant battle with my six-year-old. Get outside. <laughs> I don't care if it's zero degrees. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so diversity is key. The, uh, the stereo lesions in the brainstem, mm -hmm. uh, did they correct them? I mean, you said the cows did pretty well. Yep. They did pretty well with getting rid of the stereo, but the brainstem was still Right. Permanent. That's a great question. Um, the cow that I showed did well. Only about 20%, the prognosis on a cow like that is about 20% for just what you're saying. So you might get rid of the disease, yep. but the damage is done. There's no way to... Yep, so you got to catch it early. Cows that go down very rarely get back up. This is a rare <laughs> case. Um, so there's two problems with that. One, it's hard to get antimicrobials from an injection to the brain. The brain's a pretty privileged site. 
and uh, it's really hard to get antimicrobials inside of the uh, into the central nervous system. Penicillin we think can do that because the brain's already inflamed and we can get uh, the, the drug past the blood brain barrier. We do have some other antimicrobials and the, the human field has a plethora of, of drugs that they can use. But you're exactly right. Scarring in central nervous tissue, very similar to kidney and liver, is very difficult if, in, if not impossible to regenerate. So you can have residual deficits. This cow did, she did fine, which was a very rare case. She had two or three calves and then the teaching herd moved to campus. So she's not in the herd anymore. Yep. If the calf survives a uh, early uh, gestational, uh, so a premature labor, the calves tend to do pretty well. Catch it early, treat it early, treat it aggressively. So, um, it sounds like that problem, maybe there's other causes, but this chewing of food that, that injures their mouth, Yep. is that something that is maybe being thought about in the sense of what can we do to the food for the cows? That's, so yeah, that's, I think that's, uh, we are looking at a very, very, very small population of those animals and what we see, you know, so of a thousand cow, and the most common that I see listeria and the circling disease in this area, we have a farm in Juneau that the university does quite a bit of collaboration with. They'll run into pockets, they milk about 2,500 cows, and they'll see two or three a year and they'll see them all at once. So it's not as common. I'm not. You know, it's not a. It's not like the common cold. This is not a very common disease. But as veterinarians, we have a pretty biased population. And look, Listeria is not the only one that does that. It's the same thing with dogs. Um, you might see a dog that chews on a stick, and then the stick goes through part of its mouth. I, that that my wife's seen that. Um, and Lumpy Jaw is another one. Lumpy Jaw is a, a gram positive organization or organism that causes bony proliferations and lumps in the jaw. So it does happen, and poorly prepared feeds is one of those risks. So it's, that's one of the things we look at. Now, why, did, why, was, why has Listeria been around for a long time? Um, if you've been in the farming business or ever been in the UK, silos are sometimes pits in the ground. They're big holes in the ground. We didn't, they didn't have bunker silos hundreds of years ago. They, they dug holes in the ground, they put the feed in there, and they hoped that it would ensile there. Well, it's in direct contact with dirt and listeria lives in the dirt, just like clostridial or any other thousands of organisms that are normally there. And that's why we call it silage disease and it's associated with those pit silos. Any other questions? You can tell I really like talking about this stuff. Does the change to a bag silo change the frequency of contamination? It de it depends, you know, you know uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no, because you're using smaller lots of feed. So if you screw up in silage on one bag, you still have the rest of your bags. But we also have problems with silo, uh, those silo bags is that raccoons like to dig holes in them. Um, or as you're feeding them out, or you're driving a tractor by and it actually hits the bag and it rips the bag open. And now all of a sudden all that food's exposed to oxygen and it gets contaminated. So it's, there's pluses and minuses. I never liked them because I thought that they're hard to feed out of. But if you have multiple different variety of feeds, they're great for that. If you ever see them fill in these bags, it's very interesting because they, they bunch the bag up kind of like if you're putting on an orthopedic sock, right? Compression socks if you're a runner. Um, and they, they bunch it up and then they dump the feed into this hopper and it crushes the feed into the bag to fill it up like a worm, and it actually pushes the tractor along. And it's very interesting. Is, 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 is the silage uh, heated by, by its own, uh, as it yeah, as why, it burns, yeah. it gets hot, and it seems to me You see it smoke, or you see silos start on fire, right? Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, one is with the bags that are horizontal, that would seem like they would generate less heat, because mm -hmm. it's less concentrated, the, yeah. the larger, the tall silos would yeah. uh, be better in some sense, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so silage gets hot because it's exposed to oxygen. If you expose too much of it to oxygen, all of a sudden, all the aerobic microorganisms are going to start using that oxygen and metabolizing. Creates a lot of heat as a byproduct, just similar to warm-blooded animals. 
um, and in some of those silo fires it gets really warm and then you get an ambient temperature that gets hot uh, and it, it creates a lot of heat and it can start and the silo gases that are given off as byproducts are combustible and that's why we have silo fires and they burn very slowly and insidiously so they're really hard to put out <laughs> so it does give off heat more or less uh, uh, nutritious yep. and, and uh, other bacteria mm -hmm. they, they survive with which you don't want to. And yeah. Then, uh, so silage that's hot, you should not feed animals because it's contaminated with, if there's an overgrowth of bacteria that you do not want to put into a cow's rumen. So that silage that gets really hot and steaming, that gets thrown away. The interesting part about listeria and why it's associated with dairy products too is that it survives refrigerated temperatures. It's one of those bacteria that does okay in a refrigerator um, and uh, where most bacteria don't grow at all. And that's one of the things about listeria is it grows in cold temperatures as well. Uh, some bacteria do that and that's kind of a, kind of a gee whiz fact about listeria. Yes. Like yep. Definitely. So we don't test. We have that question quite a bit. Can I test my silage sample for listeria? We're going to find some listeria in there. We just don't want a lot of listeria. Mm -hmm. And we don't test silage for listeria. We look for quality of other, you can see other molds. And we look at the pH of the silage. We also look at nutrient content. Every time one of these bunker silos is open, there's a nutritionist there grabbing a sample so they know how much fiber, how much non-digestible proteins and other things are in there to, to formally, uh, to formulate that diet, right? Because that's really important to get these cows to make milk. Um, so different things that we do for, to prevent things like listeria overgrowth is sometimes we inoculate silage with bacteria as we're putting it into the bag to expedite the fermentation process because we want it to get really acidic really fast so it kills off all the bacteria and then it goes anaerobic and then nothing lives. That's ensiling of feeds in a nutshell. Um, things that we can do to prevent listeria would be putting bacteria in there to start that culture like yogurt. Um, we can avoid oxygen, so we avoid pockets of air. And that's why we drive those monster tractors on there to really compact that down. And then we really protect it from um, cuts or holes in the bags to get oxygen into that into that feed because we'll find we'll find it we'll definitely find it um, so it's hard to know if there's listeria in this food similar to um, the listeria that we're that you're exposed to just on a daily basis whether it's sitting in the grass you got dirt on something on your hands and you expose it is that how, what's the actual infectious load of feeding it to a cow to cause clinical disease and we don't really have that so if we feed good quality silage, we're kind of mitigating those risks for multiple different issues and good room and health. It's a hard question to answer. Yeah. Yep. In the marketplace, what foods are ranked highest and down the line in terms of um, salmonella? Yeah. In other words, our eggs or yep. yogurt. Mm -hmm. So, how would you rate, rate the various foods that most of us buy mm -hmm. in the supermarket? For sal we'll start with salmonella. Yeah. Salmonella would be what I would consider raw poultry mm -hmm. and uncooked eggs, so eggs that you buy. Eggs in the grocery store are not designed to be eaten raw, unlike what we see in the movies. Um, we, they're designed to be cooked before they're eaten, right? So especially if you're an elderly or young person in that high risk group, those are foods that should be cooked, right? So other, uh, for E. coli, for an example, uh, we're also looking at raw produce and unraw meats, right? So that's why we cook and wash food before we eat it. Things like uh, steak tartare, which is really common in my family around the holidays, you know, I, I don't have my kids eat that. I eat it, it tastes pretty good, but I'm an immunocompetent adult and I'm not pregnant. <laughs> but when my wife was pregnant, she, our, with our first child, I was actually 
you know, there are a lot of things that we changed her diet. She couldn't eat at Jimmy John. She hated that. We, we didn't go eat sushi, right? So we mitigated those risks. Um, your question about yogurt. Yogurt and um, some cheeses that are made from raw milk that you can buy at Pick and Save. Uh, yogurt is a, a lactobacillus mainly bacteria, and it's something that is cultured. So those are controlled pretty tightly in their overgrowth with a, a healthy type of bacteria for your gut. So spoiled products are a little bit different because they're gonna change the fat and the bacterial content. And that's why we refrigerate even pasteurized milk um, because they're, the most food poisoning comes from post-purchase and post-processing contamination. So you have that egg salad that sits out on the picnic table in the day like today for hours. Mm -hmm. It's the bacteria like to grow, that's why we refrigerate it to keep that contamination down. Um, I forgot what I was talking about. So Keith, how, how dangerous is beer? <laughs> <laughs> I had a question about that. I wanted to finish that thought. I can't remember no, no, where I was going with that. I wanted to say something. It'll come back to me. Beer. Uh, oh, uh, cheeses. I'll come back to cheeses. I'll do cheeses now and come then go to beer. Cheese, you can go to Pick and Save and you can buy really nice Parmesan cheese that's made from raw milk. Parmesan and raw milk cheddars, those are hard cheeses. They've been aged for usually a year plus. The really good cheddars, the really sharp cheddars, those have been aged. And when they're aged, they get very acidic and that kills bacteria, okay? That's very different from a raw milk soft cheese that you would get at in Mexico. So raw milk, soft cheeses, uh, farmer cheeses that aren't fermented or acidified or stored, those are higher risk. We, you can't buy those in Wisconsin. You can buy them in Vermont, you can buy them in Oregon. Um, so those are things that I would watch out. Beer, that will get, now beer. I had a question about beer the other day. They thought they found an animal in their beer bottle and I said, call the Department of Health, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Beer's made is pasteurized. So beer in a bottle is pasteurized, definitely. Beer in a keg is not. That's why kegs are always in the refrigerator. So yes, how come uh, in Europe, uh, especially in specific countries, um, fresh soft cheeses are uh, traditional and they are still so uh, frequently uh, consumed and available from farmer markets to grocery stores, so how come they survive that, um, and is there, speaking of which, um, ranking among industrialized countries uh, of, of these epidemics and infections versus those who don't, and what's different? Right, that's a great question, because you can go to Italy and France and you can buy raw milk in a vending machine. Thank God for mascarpone, yep. otherwise we wouldn't have the army Right, <laughs> yep, <laughs> exactly. So. Why don't we see problems there? We do. Um, the hotbeds of listeria are in Italy and France. The Pasteur Institute in France specializes in listeriosis research. And why, where do we see them? In high risk populations. Populations that have only lived in the city, right? And they're not exposed to those pathogens, pregnant women, immunocompromised adults. Um, the other things that uh, we see in Europe are, uh, I had a friend of mine, resident, surgery resident, she was from France, uh, she was from Paris, and she didn't like Wisconsin cheese, and I thought that was blasphemy, right? <laughs> she said it doesn't taste good enough. It, does, does, doesn't, it doesn't have that strong odor and, and taste, and it's just different based on your, of, the, of those cultures, and it goes back to those high-risk groups. They have the same risks that we do, um, the reason why we really fight raw milk here is because our dairy industry is a $44 billion a year business to the Wisconsin economy. And that's why, and people don't differentiate raw versus pasteurized products when there's a problem with a milk supply in Duran, Wisconsin, or Racine, Wisconsin. They look, the whole dairy industry as a whole takes a hit. And if you don't think that affects you, which we live in Madison, why would one farm out of 9,000 have be a problem. Remember when the grasslands uh, dairy, when that closed 70 dairies, right? In uh, February, March, that affected the entire city of Waupon, the entire city of Fond du Lac. Even if you didn't 
work on a farm. If you sold farm equipment, you sold trucks, um, you worked in the schools, it affects the entire community when it affects our biggest industry. Yes, sir. Um, I, I heard what you said about um, how it was like bad to drink raw, um, raw cow's milk. Mm -hmm. um, is, it the, is it also true for goat milk? Great question. Uh, what I can tell you about goat milk, goats and cows are very similar. They sound different, their milk tastes different, and their goats are smaller, right? They have the same diet, and they both can shed uh, microbes and like E. coli, Campylobacter, Listeria, Salmonella, same as a cow. I did a study when I was in Oregon. I had a student sample a goat dairy bulk tank once a day for 30 days. That dairy made cheeses for the pasteurized cheese for the farmer's market. We found listeria in two samples sporadically. So it does happen, and it happens sporadically. It's hard to predict, right? And we don't test all milk, right? A grade A dairy will test milk once a month for the Department of Health, or they might test once a year for that grade A status. So the answer to your question is yes, and it really depends on what you're using the milk for and how you treat it after you collect it. Hygiene is very, very important on all food production. Good question. Yes, sir. We've been using powdered milk for years, but recently we've been having a problem in that it doesn't last very long and it's curdled in a day or two. Hmm. And I used to ship out truckloads of powdered milk from the dairy mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Yep. In the late 40s. So powdered milk is a commercial product that's just all over the place. Yeah. The powdered milk is in a lot of our food, just like liquid egg. Mm -hmm. um, and why you're having a specific problem, it might be dependent on how the product is stored or what product you're using or how you're using it. Um, and I, I think it would be a, an individual case on why that is. As an industry alone, uh, we had a huge problem with powdered milk in China. You remember the melamine crisis? Um, so what melanin was is that it was a way to increase the value of your milk. And everyone thought if you put just a little bit in, no one would really care. Well, it turns out it, it made a big difference. It was toxic. Um, and that was in their powdered milk. So that was, a, that was a chemical contaminant. And it goes to show another way that one source of, of a milk or a food product can disseminate into a population. Your specific question, it might be unique though. Yep. Um, so you showed the picture of the uh, one salmonella organism that yep. got very long. How does that help it survive in adverse environments? Great question. So as it <clears throat> creates these long filaments, it's more resistant to high stress conditions. So and why long filaments versus a, a, a ball or a globule, we're not, we're not totally sure. We know that dry conditions, high salt, um, and acidic conditions will make them do this, but we don't know why they elongate versus going smaller. That's an excellent question. Why is long and more surface area more important? I don't know. Dr. Casper might know. We should get him in here. He's a good speaker too. He's, Dr. Casper works in microbial science. He's a bacteriologist. So he looks at uh, E. coli, OH157, salmonella, other bacterial contaminants of food. Do, yes, sir. Do farms uh, that, have, that just use raw milk, do they have to be tested? I mean, I think as long as they don't sell it, I think. Right. And anyone in this room can go to a dairy and do what's called an incidental sale. So you could go to the dairy cattle center here and say, I would like a gallon of milk and they can sell it to you. We just can't sell it on a retail market. We can't advertise for it. We can't have a retail store. So those dairies that have a grade A milk qualification, they have a specific somatic cell count, which are white blood cells in the milk. You have to have a, a specific number of those or less or a plate count of bacteria or less. And the plate count of bacteria is, I think, it's either 25 or 3,500 cells per microliter, bacterial colony forming units. So they are tested on a monthly basis um, 
for bacterial quality and somatic cell quality. But for a farm to sell on a day-to-day -day basis, there's no mechanism to be able to do that. And when you think about a, a, a raw milk product, those are designed even on any farm that, because there's a, a significant population of the people that want those products, right? They tend to be highly educated, they tend to be male, and they tend to be wealthy. Okay? A lot of research that supports that. We did a study that we're just publishing now that repeats that. Why they want it, it, it there's a bunch of different factors. There's nutritional value, there's healing properties. It tastes good. I like that taste. I love the whole milk, right? The, the fat gives it a lot of great taste, but it's designed to be consumed immediately or within a day or two. All of our tests that we have take hours to days to identify pathogens in milk, whether it's listeria, E. coli, um, Klebsiella, things like that. It takes us time to be able to do that. We don't have technology that can dip, take a dipstick into milk and say, yep, it's positive or negative. We just don't, that, the, that technology is in its infancy to be able to mass produce. We could do it. Um, we just don't have it in a mass scale. So the answer to your question would be no, we don't test daily. We just can't. It costs too much money. But it can be sold? Can, it can be sold in incidental. And there's a risk associated with that. Sorry, what, what does that mean, incidental? Incidental means that you could walk up to any farm and say, I would like to purchase a gallon of milk and they could sell it to you. Is that but they, legal? It is legal. In Wisconsin, incidental sale is legal, definitely. So you could go up and buy that. There's just going to be a risk associated with it. Yes, ma'am. Maybe going back to why they are male and uh, wealthy and well educated might have to do with that weight thing, yeah? Um, anyways, can you update us with that famous uh, farmer with his way, raw way versus the courts? And also, since um, contamination from animals to people has so much to do with the growing conditions. Do you think there is a difference between animals grown on organic versus conventional farms? Mm -hmm. uh, the first question on the farmers, the uh, with the or, uh, was an Amish raw way, there's a couple of them out there, and there's it's um, arguing raw, the benefits of raw dairy products is almost like arguing religion. Um, it's really challenging, and there's not a lot of science behind it. Um, there's a lot of peer-reviewed science about the dangers and risks. There's no peer-reviewed science of the benefits. The benefits that talk about, and this is important if you read about it, the benefits talk about pasteurization changing a protein. So people that are lactose intolerant, they tend to uh, um, tolerate milk, raw milk, better than pasteurized milk. That's been debunked. It really not, has nothing to do with pasteurization or heat. It's all about a very specific type of protein, and some cows carry this gene. It's an um, alpha, I'm blanking on it, it'll come to me. A technician that works in our hospital breeds those cows and sells that milk um, because it's a different, um, a different protein that's less allergenic. So that's the first question. The second question, um, what was your second question? Oh, it's about uh, organic yeah, pasture-based or organic dairies versus confinement um, or what we call a KFO, concentrated feed. Um, so the, the best data I could, can tell you about that would be um, animals or cows that are fed higher grain diets are more likely to shed e OH157 E. coli. So that's certainly at, at a different risk. We also have a risk of, or increased risk because we have all manure in one spot, right? We also have changes in how we process those animals, whether they're in a small meat market like the Lodi Sausage Company versus Oscar Mayer, right? They have a bigger operation, there's a bigger chance of contamination leading to more contaminated food products. Now, <clears throat> what's the happy medium between risk, cost, and availability of feed? <coughs> That's a really good question. That I can talk about those risks, but I would leave my opinion out of it. All antibiotics added to the feed for the animals? For food animals? Yeah. Yes. 
And if, if they are added, do they anyway play a role mm -hmm. in the multi-resistant drug uh, phenomena? Great question. That's the center of a topic of many debates in the Food and Drug Administration and the uh, uh, animal agriculture. And it has been, and what's changed recently is we talk about tonnage of antimicrobials in feed. The FDA has now come out with what's called the uh, Veterinary Feed Directive, where uh, antimicrobials into feed for growth promotant. So we feed, or in the, in the industry itself, we'll feed antimicrobials to um, encourage good populations or of, of bacteria that can help digest feed and it will discourage the non-ideal uh, bacteria. It helps animals grow faster. It's not just antimicrobials that do that, like antibiotics, like a penicillin. There are other additives that do that that aren't necessarily antibiotics. We changed how that can happen uh, significantly by saying that you can't use antimicrobials for growth promotion. Now you might see that on your label of chicken, right? No antibiotics used during the production of this chicken. See that on the label in the grocery store? That we haven't had been able to do that for quite some time. Um, and though those rules are constantly changing. Does it create antimicrobial resistance? It depends on what data that you read. There are some papers out there that really think, and it seems if you're feeding tons, metric tons of antimicrobials to food animals, it's gotta change the antimicrobial resistance, right? That's logic, but there are, there's just as much data out there that shows that the uh, prescribing over prescription of antimicrobials to people and animals has just as much, if not more damage than adding it to their feed. Is it a good idea to add antimicrobials to the feed? But logically, I would say probably not, but it's all about how do we make that food affordable for the people that purchase it? Not everyone can go to Whole Foods or the conscious carnivore and pay for their feed, or th their feed, their dinner. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's very complicated when we get into the economics and the ethics and the ability to feed the population. Uh, we, if meat, production of meat and milk isn't very efficient if you compare it to soy or plantains or other cassava in Africa, but as the world industrializes and we have more a greater economy, more people can afford uh, animal-based protein. And even though it's uh, less uh, f uh, efficient to grow and to produce, uh, the worldwide demand for both of those products is skyrocketing. So we still have to deal with this and how do we make it affordable and safe for the population. That's a good question. I don't think there's enough data out there to show that. Um, GMOs, that's another very hot topic. <laughs> um, I have very little experience with GMOs other than transgenic mice during my PhD. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, so ma'am. What type of meat would be safest if there's any? Is it fish better than I would say the safest meat that you can eat is that that you buy fresh, you follow the directions, and you cook it well. Unfortunately, I don't like my hamburgers cooked well. I don't like my steak cooked well. So it's all about your risk. So refrigeration and storage is key. Post product processing and purchasing of the contaminated of that food, that's a big issue. Seafood tends to uh, spoil quicker than uh, red meat and poultry and swine. I don't know why that is. It must come with a higher load to, to begin with. No. Good question. How is, are there any tornadoes outside? How are we doing? Okay. Well, thanks for your attention. I think we're, we're losing the rest of the crowd, but if you have any other questions, please let me know.